Hello friends and welcome to my new video in which I will tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, two co-workers teamed up against me, but I defeated them. Roy, a male co-worker of mine who works in retail, is a teenager. You can probably guess where this is headed. The problem is that his girlfriend has to deal with this because he's dating my shift manager. Please don't poo where you eat. I genuinely questioned him about why he mocked at me. In front of customers, he began yelling at me and declaring I detest confrontation. It's horrible because it makes me uneasy. It's not always negative. Because I don't like it, it's horrible. I shot back saying that he had already ignored me or scoffed at inquiries. I would ask about work that I also treat my other employees the same way. Normally, I inquire about the clarity and conveyance. But have you been able to clear tables? What is this? It seems like he is saying that inquiries about work are still considered confrontational. He dismissed me when I told him that it was improper to be impolite or make fun of a customer, claiming that the person deserved it. Or that, to ensure everything runs smoothly, I only remind him of the company policies we must abide by. He stated that he doesn't care what I think because he believes the policies are meaningless and dumb. He would shout over me every time I offered my side of the story, telling me it doesn't matter since he's uncomfortable. I didn't scream at all. All I did was remain silent. Every consumer was staring at us. Despite my shift lead's best efforts, we remained agitated. I quickly called the manager right away to let her know what had happened and to request that I never be scheduled with Roy again. We then attempted to have an impromptu chat when I initially turned down. Because, in my opinion and experience, conversations with people who believe they are right or have never showed you respect are never fruitful and never worthwhile, particularly if they believe they are correct. Roy yelled at me once more, but this time I answered him loudly, and he stopped. He has already been forewarned not to yell at me or interrupt me. He responded to my request for an apology in a passive-aggressive manner. I apologize for shouting at you. I apologize for what I did in public. I apologize for your feelings. I apologize for making you feel unimportant. He agreed when I called him up on his phony apology, then stated that he doesn't care that I'm wrong. I thus threatened to leave if the shift didn't stop silent and allow me to talk. I essentially addressed all the things he had done that I never confronted him with. Other employees have voiced complaints, but management seems overly lenient. He was infuriated with another employee before dating the shift. He called her a dumb bit for rejecting him and blamed her for being assaulted at her former workplace, over which she is currently facing legal action randomly running into me all the time, screaming at me now. Roy wants to schedule a meeting with the four of us again, according to my store manager. I inform him that I have no desire to speak with the little youngster. He has already yelled at me and put me down during the two discussions we've had so far. I would prefer not to speak with Roy at all or to step down from my position. In addition, I was very uncomfortable because Roy had phoned. Additionally, he was dating the shift at her house, in her room. This, given the circumstances, is totally improper. I fired a few of my male co-workers for harassing their fellow employees. These guys used to ask me questions and tell me about all their attractions, even after I warned them against it. A shift lead justified his friend's bullying on a former female employee. I was harassed by a guy myself. I just believe that strange, socially awkward people keep coming to this job. I think it's time for me to pursue a new work, even though I adored the customers in my store. I also have a tape of my female co-workers making jokes about who they would choose to bully. What would we do if they weren't here for us to make fun of? I was made fun of by a co-worker for my financial ill circumstances. Jesus. Technically, Joanna, one of our newest employees, has been with us for at least six months. It implies that she isn't brand new. However, she is a sloth and doesn't work. She cannot recall anything. She can't even recall that she was required to report for duty. She did, however, remember to go out with her partner on Valentine's Day instead of working. Joanna and Roy are both well known for their terrible personalities and laziness, each in a unique manner. To summarize the earlier data, Ivory, a shift manager Roy is dating, has a habit of dipping her pen in the company's ink because she previously dated our former assistant manager. He received no punishment for this action, and I haven't spoken to the pair at work since then. I only reply to them when it has to do with the job. But when I arrived at work today, Joanna pulled me aside to discuss our private life. Basically, it was about how her ex-boyfriend broke up with her and threw her out of the house. To be fair, their relationship lasted about a month, during which time she was vacationing at his house. They are not cohabiting. Joanna remains and begins gesturing at my coworkers and uttering immature remarks such as, I just want someone to understand me. I'm not friends with X and Y because they disagreed with me. She launches into an exclamation about her desire to save lives. How, despite their inherent goodness, humans only act out and mistreat others as a result of personal pain. She suffers from a severe saver complex. Things like trying to diagnose her ex-boyfriend with BPD by calling his therapist, which I didn't think was acceptable, 
She practically begs for my agreement. She's crying. Subsequently, she expressed her anger towards me and keeps saying, don't talk to me, don't talk to me, go away. Subsequently, she again starts narrating to everyone how she spotted the number 777. A customer named Angel owed the company $7.77 in total. She was told falsehoods about 777 being an angelic number and about what her intuition was teaching her about the universe. I was aware when she was intoxicated and high, she frequently sends me random text messages. Roy is furious with me for reporting him. Additionally, the fact that people learned about his treatment of me just served to enhance his already negative reputation. Roy notices that she despises me right now. Therefore, the enemy of my enemy is a friend, is correct? And he begins to provoke her and speak to her in whispers. My two other co-workers would overhear them and report back to me on their conversations. We're shutting for the day, so eventually I was wiping the tables. Joanna gets upset and starts screaming at me, telling me to ask her before wiping. They, although she is still officially an employee, she is a customer. I'm sorry, but she still acts quite rudely and aggressively, and my colleagues are freaking out when they observe this. They also approach me and express regret for her actions. That wasn't justified. Later on, when I'm doing the dang dishes, Roy approaches me and sneers in my face. He's aware that he provoked her to scream at me, and he thought it was pretty good. I'm aware that this is incorrect. I'm petty. I'll own that. However, why not, since I won't be working here anyhow? I might as well, if he is a racist. I gave him a quick spritz for my water faucet. Hardly any water touched him, but he became really enraged. My manager messages me right away. He emails me a screen grab of Joanna berating me and accusing me of badly treating Roy, Ivory, and Joanna and projecting my pain onto my coworkers. I'm forcing Joanna to resign. My blood pressure seemed to be through the roof. I'm crying in the back of the home since I'm over these folks. Roy and Joanna are often giggling and chatting about me, and after that, they begin to harass my colleagues. They even screamed at the shift manager for today. They both laughed at the rest of us, and they left work together. Horrible, awful individuals. Thank goodness I got screenshots from my shift manager of a group discussion that I wasn't in. It appears that Joanna's behavior was reported by four other employees. Joanna has been harassing everyone by utilizing her predicament with her ex-boyfriend. Roy has already been reported by every employee. However, my manager isn't announcing or taking an action or decisions against any action. Hopefully, everyone in this gets fired, but who knows? Update. Both employees were let go. Joanna made fun of a patron, and she is now in a mental health facility after her buddy reported her to the police. My reaction of anger is purposefully meant to make people uncomfortable. What was the nonsense she posted in public? And with her social worker, she told her that she had magical thinking, which is code for crazy. She actually believed them. Roy lost his mind and resigned on his own. He had been working there weekends with his fiance for the past year, but he didn't want to start doing that right away. He felt it was unjust that no work coworker will cover him, and despite the fact that he did not request time off for a week in beforehand. The management naturally dismissed him once he threatened to resign. I assume that my colleagues are hosting a bar crawl and are departing, and I was invited for an interview for my dream job, so I suppose justice prevails after all. Sometimes we encounter such characters in life, but the important thing is that you stood up to them and defeated them. Your ability to stand up to the discrimination and bad behavior from your coworkers deserves to be honored. You made the right call and used all available means to protect yourself from injustice and harassment. The relationship between personal and professional space has boundaries, and you know it well when those boundaries were crossed. It's important to maintain your dignity and try to achieve the best when the environment is not conducive to positive development. In addition, it's encouraging that your efforts led to the dismissal of individuals who broke the rules and engaged in unacceptable behavior. This confirms that justice will sometimes still be served to those who do not know how to respect others. I wish you success in your new job and hope that it will be a supportive and respectful environment. The next story is, HOA destroyed my property. My family had owned the vacation home for many generations. It served as our getaway by the lake, a tranquil setting full of treasured memories. I expected to find it standing tall and welcoming as usual when I drove up one beautiful afternoon. Rather, I discovered a heap of debris. My heart fell. The summer cottage I had cherished was no longer there. Instead, there was a construction turmoil and noise. I felt as though someone had punched me in the stomach as I stood there. How is it possible that this could occur? Why would one act in such a way? My surprise soon gave way to rage. I walked over to the construction crew and asked for clarification. They shrugged and explained that they were merely carrying out the homeowners association's directives. The worst part is that I wasn't even a member of their HOA. My land was not under their purview. I went directly to the HOA office where Mr. Thompson, the president, gave me a smug smirk. He said that the office had been deciding to construct a new park and that my property was ideal for it, as if it was the most sensible thing in the world. Ideal for it? They assumed that since I didn't live there permanently, I wouldn't mind. 
My heart raced, but I remained composed. I informed Mr. Thompson that they will regret their tremendous error. He did not seem to be taking me seriously. He just grinned. I worked with a true shark of a lawyer, and between us, we obtained all the proof we required, including witness accounts, my property deeds, and pictures of the destroyed house. We brought legal action for unlawful trespassing, emotional suffering, and property destruction. I didn't stop there, though. I got in touch with the local press and told them of my experience. The people were furious. I quickly called on the homeowners association that they might destroy a person's home without their consent. The HOA was under a great deal of strain. In my investigation of the HOA's activities, I also learned that they had a track record of going too far. Equipped with this knowledge, I lodged grievances with multiple municipals and state regulatory bodies. Now the HOA was being closely watched. On the day of our hearing, my attorney made a strong argument. The judge was obviously not impressed by the HOA's flagrant disrespect for the law and Mr. Thompson's casual demeanor. The HOA was forced to rebuild my summer cottage and pay large damages for mental distress, and the verdict came back quickly. That wasn't all, though. Many infractions were found throughout the HOA inquiry. They received heavy fines, and Mr. Thompson was the one of the dismissed board members. Other tenants sued him for mismanagement after feeling duped and enraged. What about the park? The initiative was doomed to fail. The money was directed to fix the harm that the HOA's careless choices had caused. Many of the neighbors apologized to me after my summer house was renovated and looked even more magnificent than before. They had no idea what the HOA was up to. I felt a thrill of satisfaction as I stood on the porch of my rebuilt summer house and looked out over the serene lake. If justice was done, I reclaim my heaven and the HOA was forced to learn a harsh lesson. Nobody would dare touch it again for this time. The next story is, the visitor turned out to be a very bad person. We'll refer to him as Joe. This is his tale. It's a little long, but I promise that it progresses. It gets better and better, or worse and worse, depending on how you take the weird stuff he did. One winter's afternoon in December, Joe comes in and says he needs somewhere to stay because he lost his wallet. He says he's not expecting us to give him a free stay. Instead, he waited to see if he can obtain a prepaid visa from a nearby business or another source. All right, fine, whatever. He plugs in his phone while sitting in the lobby. I wait as well. After hearing him in our small market next to the front desk for an hour, I go outside and find out what's going on. With his phone connected into the closest socket, he sits on the floor. He spends a while on the phone with his friend, and I find it annoying that he spends hours chatting on the phone without making an attempt to attain a prepaid card. I ask him for an update as he hangs up. He claims that the funds are in his account. All he has is an electronic card. He responded that he does have a virtual card when I asked. If he had the money in his account, I could manually enter the virtual card information. I informed him, as I did, and he insisted that he did, and his card was turned down. Several times, he then yells, you didn't tell me I'd have to pay now. Out of rage, I clarified that the permission hold was put in place to make sure the money was present. He said that he never consented to pay now. After a brief period of calmness, Joe promised to text his friend to see if he could share images of his other credit cards. Yeah, the one he claimed to have lost. Three more cards, three more transactions that were refused. And then he inquired as to his mother's ability to pay. Sure, I said, provided she completed a CC authorization form. Joe gave his mother a call, and I tried to email her the auth form, but she wouldn't give me her email address. She added that she wasn't paying for garbage and ended the call with him. Joe vanishes for a good 20 minutes inside the bathroom. He phones his mother again to beg for more money when he returns. She insists on speaking with me. Not in person, either. She makes a video call demand. It surprises you to learn that this is not the first time someone has contacted their parents and asked to speak with me, but he then asks me to speak with her. However, unlike Joe, such folks are typically older than 21. Okay, whatever it takes to get this guy to stop pestering me like he's been doing for hours. Joe passes me his phone, and his mother makes a video call. And before I can even say hello, she asks, Do you really work at Hotel's name? And is Joe actually present? Yes, ma'am. Uh... All right, well, since Joe constantly tells lies to people, I just had to be sure. People are consistently taking advantage of. Joe, who is manning the front desk, chuckles uneasily and says, that's not true. He wants his room to be paid for by me. What is the price? I told her the breakdown of the costs, request an authorization form, and clarify that our incidentals hold. There's no way in heck I'd ever pay for his incidentals, she added, laughing incredulously. He F'd S up all over the place, and I won't take accountability for this mess. I apologize for taking up your time. She hung up after that, and I handed Joe his phone back to him while he was trembling and remarked, huh, She really doesn't mean all that stuff, she said. Oh, that's right. Look, I'm sorry, but I'll have to ask you to leave if you can't provide a valid source of payment, I stated. Then, because he was making me nervous, I made up an excuse, saying, My boss already texted me that and asked why someone was loitering in the lobby for hours. So again, I apologize, but you can't stay here. 
So that's when he wouldn't take his anger out only on me and would know that he was aware of the cameras and potential witnesses. Outraged, he exclaimed, loitering? As a visitor, I'm looking for a legitimate payment method, and you're telling me to get out of here? Why the F did you not inform me of this several hours ago rather than wasting my time? And he bounded out and came storming back 20 minutes later, claiming that his dad will be there in five minutes to sell the hotel payments. After purchasing a snack, Joe took a seat in the lobby. Five minutes afterward, he took in a usually extended break to use the restroom, returned outside, and before I could order him to go again, he was gone. I discovered that less than a month later, he was arrested while I was reading the local news a little while later, and then attacked two jailed policemen. I checked his criminal history and whoa, he had faced charges in the previous few years for receiving stolen property, possessing and possessing illegal narcotics, harassing others, stealing from others, stealing movable property, using a motor vehicle without authorization, conspiring to steal an automobile, and altering or falsifying physical evidence. And a few of those incidents occurred more than once. Like, and then he stole another automobile a few months later and repeatedly engaged in retail theft. The most recent incident that landed him in jail, though, he had been abusing his sister physically, harassing her, screaming at her, and then pulling a effing pistol on her. Additionally, there was an occasion where a female cop was walking by his breakfast tray while he was in the county jail, and he reached through the bars to grab her, hard, and refused to let go. A male officer arrived as soon as she called for assistance. Joe then took the male officer's wristwatch and tore it off with his other hand. This guy wouldn't release or let go of the female officer unless they effing tased him. Thus, four additional charges have been added. And since then, nothing has come to my attention. I'm assuming he's in jail awaiting a hearing, but what a S-show, man. Given that I was the only employee in the hotel that evening, I consider myself fortunate that he did not injury. Moreover, I'm a little woman. And if that's true, I was duped and didn't know what he was doing at first. But the drawbacks were unbearable at the hotel where I used to work at. It was common for the nearby churches to house homeless people in rooms for a week or two. I previously assisted the homeless at work. The encounter with a kind homeless veteran who was housed for two weeks stands out in my memory the most. I threw together a number of materials for him since he wanted some assistance getting his act together. I printed out papers for him, called around to nearby food banks, and gave him the information and just talked to him in general while he was there. In fact, I scheduled a meeting for him and a social worker to come offer him financial and or housing support at his request. He was appreciative of my assistance and it went pretty well. It's sentimental recollections for me. I believe there is a deep desire within me of helping others. I'm not sheltered or naive, but occasionally this drive might blind me to the fact that someone is taking advantage of me. It's important to remember that trying to help others is important, but it's also important to differentiate between situations and be cautious. You did well to help this homeless veteran earlier, but the story of Joe shows how important it is to be careful and conscious about who you help. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.